Some people say you are what you eat, but it's not true. You are what you digest, you know, or you are what you don't poop. So the bacteria are the ones that are making those decisions for the most part. You can't do it on your own. I'd like to welcome to the show, Ocean Robbins. How you doing, Ocean? Doing well, Alex. Glad to be with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I've wanted, I've, I've been an admirer of yours for some time. I love your book, The 31 Day Food Revolution. And, uh, and I think it's a book that we, that desperately needs to be talked about more and more because there's, it's a lot of great, great information in there. And there's so much stuff coming at us about nutrition and what to eat, what not to eat, how to eat, well, this kind of stuff. Uh, and a lot of misinformation out there. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put you on the show. So I think it's we should start at the beginning of this journey, which didn't begin with you, but began with your father. Um, can you tell us first who your grandfather was? You bet. So my grandpa, uh, Irvin Robbins, founded an ice cream company. It was called Baskin Robbins. He founded it with his brother-in-law, Bert Baskin. And uh, it became the world's most successful ice cream company. And my dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer. He was groomed to one day join and running the family company. All the family cats were named after ice cream flavors. And my dad was inventing flavors at the age of eight. He invented Jamocha almond fudge for the, for the ice cream aficionados of the world. And however, as he got a little older, he learned about um, the impact of food on health. And his own uh, uncle, Bert Baskin, ended up dying of heart disease at the age of 54. Wow, that's really young. Yeah, and, and my dad's uncle, Bert, I never, I never knew him. He was a beautiful man. He, he was one of the most successful entrepreneurs in American history. But, um, you know, he didn't have his health. And he left his wife a widow and his kids fatherless. And um, you know, my dad just realized he didn't want to spend his life selling a product that might contribute to more people suffering. I mean, an ice cream cone is not going to kill anybody. And ice cream's brought a lot of smiles to a lot of faces, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that statistically, the more ice cream we eat, the more likely we are to get certain diseases like heart disease. And so, um, you know, my dad ended up making a very tough choice to leave the family business, to leave the path that his dad had outlined for him and uh, walk away from any access to the family fortune and follow his own rocky road, as we say <laughs> in our family. He ended up moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada, where they built a one-room log cabin, grew most of their own food, practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day, and named their kid Ocean. They almost <laughs> named me Kale, by the way, and this was before Kale was cool. But we did eat a lot of kale and cabbage and carrots and other veggies from the garden. As I got a little older, we ended up moving to California. And my dad came out with a book in 1987 called Diet for a New America, which inspired millions of people to look at their food choices as a chance to make a difference on the planet. The media called him the rebel without a cone, <laughs> among other things. One of his readers ended up being my grandpa, Irvin Robbins, who read the book at the age of 69. Now, my grandpa had always eaten the standard American diet, plus a double scoop of ice cream. And now he was facing the standard American diseases. He had serious diabetes weight issues and heart issues, high blood pressure, et cetera, I was taking a whole bunch of medications that had debilitating side effects. And uh, his doctors tell him he didn't have long to live unless he made some big changes. And they give him a copy of my dad's book. He read it, he followed its advice. He ended up cutting way down on his meat consumption, eating way more fruits and vegetables, cutting way down on sugar. He gave up ice cream. Wow. And he got incredible results. He wound up reversing his diabetes, reversing his heart disease, reversing his obesity, and living 19 more healthy years. So we really have seen in our family what happens when we follow the status quo, like my dad's uncle did, like my grandpa did for most of his life. And we've seen what can happen when we make a change. And so, you know, I was inspired by my grandpa's legacy, honestly, both of making a big impact on the planet, but also of being willing to make a change when you learn new information. And also by my dad's example of integrity and moral fiber, and uh, and also the the leadership he's shown in bringing awareness of the impact of food to the world. And so, in my own journey, I founded a nonprofit when I was 16, called Yes, worked with young leaders in 65 countries 
uh, over the course of 20 years, focused on leadership development and social change mobilization. And as I traveled the globe, I saw that everybody was eating and that what we're eating is having this massive impact. I work with indigenous leaders in the Amazon whose rainforest is being cut down for cattle. I work with indigenous leaders in the Arctic whose climate is being destabilized and the caribou migration that their tribes depend on is being devastated by climate change, which is all being fueled by cattle. I worked with indigenous leaders and, and uh, you know, non-indigenous leaders in many countries all over the planet. And I kept seeing that the American way of eating is spreading and ways of growing food with pesticides and factory farms, ways of processing food with sugar and additives and chemicals and packaging were spreading around the globe in KFC and McDonald's and Baskin Robbins mm -hmm. spreading around the world. And as we export our way of eating, we're also exporting our health outcomes. The United States you know, is the wealthiest country in the world, but we have the highest rate of obesity in the world. You know, two thirds of our population is overweight or obese. We have the sickest population in the history of humanity. The average senior in the US takes 12 prescription medications per year. Wow. You know, life expectancy has started to go down in this country, but health expectancy has been going down for a long time. More and more, more of us are living chronically sick, yet we're spending 19% of our entire gross domestic product in the US on what we euphemistically call healthcare, but it's really disease symptom management. So now I'm on a mission to change all that. So I launched Food Revolution Network with my dad in 2012. And for the last 10 plus years, we've been spreading the message of healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all. We've grown to over 700,000 members. And uh, we've got a big purpose. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of people joining the movement right now. That's amazing. It's so fascinating that that your grandfather was able to turn his health around so quickly by just food changes where most of uh, Western society is told that you need medicine, you need this, you need that. But it goes back to the father of medicine who says the food is thy medicine. And yeah. I've had it in my life. My wife, uh, when I first met her, she was on medication. She was in her mid twenties. They had her on like medications for, um, um, for, uh, uh, oh God, what is it when you, um, she was on medications. I can't remember for what it's for, but she was on medications and, um, allergies. Thank you. Allergies. And, and I said, let me just change your food. And I yeah. went all organic. Yeah. And within six months she was gone and she's never touched them again. So it's remarkable. I'd love for you to talk to the audience about the impact of sugar on your health, on your body, the chemistry, what it actually does to us. And obviously you have a really front row seat to that with your grandfather and obviously being part of the, the legacy of Baskin Robbins. Well, let's, and let's make a distinction here between really three classes of things. There's gonna be what we'll call added sugars, there's natural sugars, and then there's um, artificial sweeteners. Okay, so added sugar is, most of it is actually sugar, uh, sucrose, which comes from sugar cane or from genetically engineered beet sugar. Um, and that's what we call sugar. And that's the vast majority. And then second uh, major category there is gonna be high fructose corn syrup. And, um, and then much smaller amounts, we get things like honey and, date sugar and, you know, Absolutely. coconut sugar and okay. other, other products, uh, xylitol, other kinds of sweeteners. Right. Um, so added sugars as a category are dominated by sucrose and high fructose corn syrup. And these products, uh, the average American is consuming over 60 pounds a year of them. And then we wonder why we've got an obesity epidemic. Well, it turns out that when you consume these added sugars, uh, they go straight into spiking your blood sugar very fast. That's what, they're, that's, what, that's what they're designed to do, right? They give you really fast energy, give you a big blood sugar boost, then your body has to produce insulin in order to balance it and to get that sugar into, this, into the cells where it can do good instead of being a source of danger in the body. But uh, when your body has to keep jolting with insulin over time, it can damage your insulin receptors and your body can get too high blood sugar, which can be very dangerous from a metabolic standpoint, and it can cause a cascade of various problems in the body, uh, ultimately long-term fueling obesity because the sugar gets stored in the fat cells uh, and also potentially diabetes.
uh, among other conditions. Um, essentially, added sugar is correlated with every major lifestyle illness of our times. We're talking Alzheimer's, we're talking, of course, type 2 diabetes, we're talking uh, obesity, we're talking heart disease, we're talking cancer, right? Between, between all of these conditions, you've got, uh, you know, the vast majority of deaths are caused by them in, in the modern world. And therefore, you could say that sugar is linked to most of the deaths in the modern world in one way or another. Not to say that it's the cause, but it's certainly not helping, right? So that's added sugar. And then you've got, um, you've got sugar that's naturally in foods, okay? And, and there it depends on what it's coming with, but fruit has a lot of fiber and various phytochemicals and nutrients that come with the sugar. And it turns out that even though technically food is high in sugar, it doesn't have the same effect. It, it actually can be good for many diabetics. It can be uh, correlated with positive health outcomes. And especially when you're talking about like berries, they're linked to lower rates of Alzheimer's and lower rates of cancer. So uh, stunning data on this. So not all sugars are created equal, even bananas, even dates, which are the sweetest thing out there when they're eaten in their whole form, seem to have benefit um, and, and don't have the same problems. So that's a very interesting thing. But when you refine it, even to the point of making fruit juice, you change the outcome and you get something different that can be much more problematic. So you really want the fruit in its whole form in order to get the whole benefits and not have those the liabilities that come with just sort of extracting the sugar. I suspect that if we could eat sugar cane, that would even be fine. But of course we can't because it's too fibrous. So we have to, you know, we have to juice it and then at least dehydrate the juice. But usually it's refined quite a bit more than that. And we're actually separating out the molasses and a lot of the vitamins and minerals. And we're certainly losing the fiber, which is found in the whole plant because we actually can't digest sugar cane fiber. So, um, and then the last category, of course, is going to be artificial sweeteners like sucralose and aspartame and, and all the rest. And in general, the artificial sweeteners, um, the calorie-free artificial sweeteners seem to be correlated uh, for some semi-mysterious reasons with higher rates of obesity. Uh, even though there's no calories in there, it seems that they trick the body into thinking that it's about to get a bunch of sugar and then it doesn't and then it craves sugar. So people who consume Diet Coke or other products like that, maybe, we don't exactly know the mechanism, but they may be more likely to crave junk foods an hour later and then to binge on other things, which cause a detrimental impact. So whatever the reasons, we see the studies and we see that people who consume diet beverages are more likely to suffer from a lot of the weight issues and obesity related incidences that, that, that um, come with them. So um, that said, xylitol in particular is, could, could fall in a couple of those different categories. It seems to not have the same problems that some of the re refined sweeteners uh, and calorie-free sweeteners do. Same with stevia. So if you're looking for a lower, no calorie sort of net impact sweetener, xylitol and stevia may have some benefits in that monk, regard and, and without monk, as much of the downsides. And monk fruit as well? Yeah, monk fruit as well. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been, that's, I, I have barely any sugar in the house other than when my daughters want to bake, uh, <laughs> their young daughter. So sometimes they want to bake, but generally, even then we try to put the monk, I use the monk fruit xylitol mix and it, I've never lost. I, it's always nice. Yeah, put it in, absolutely, absolutely. Put it in my and coffee. Nice, you know, and you know, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, if you're going to use a little sweetener now and then enjoy your life, you know, it's not going to kill you. A teaspoon of sugar isn't going to kill you. Put a little sure. honey in your tea. It's not going to kill you. But mm -hmm. but long term, the more of this we eat, the, the more impactful it's going to be. And uh, we've turned sugar not just into a flavoring, but into a food mm. source. You know, it's a major yeah. source of calories in the industrialized world. And the impact on that of that on our collective health is terrifying. Now, what food should we be avoiding? So um, the top foods that I say we want to avoid are uh, processed and highly high, hyper-processed foods in general. So anything that's made in factories, you know, your body was exquisitely designed to work in harmony with nature. And the foods that your body was designed to eat uh, come in whole forms. And when you separate out parts and you, in factories, you wind up creating unintended consequences and uh, you don't get the effect you were intending. So 
all the all, even supplements frequently don't give us the benefits we expect. I mean, we, we saw that people who had lots of vitamin E on their diet had certain benefits. So then we started giving them vitamin E supplements and the opposite happened. So people who eat lots of vitamin E rich foods have lower risk of heart disease. People who take vitamin E supplements tend to have higher risk of heart disease, according to many studies. So, and we don't exactly know why, but, but that's what's happening. And so uh, when, we, when we actually study it, and so anything that comes in a package with long ingredients lists, or that's been refined, whether we're talking about white flour, which may just be called flour, you know, um, or whether we're talking about additives or different kinds, chemicals with names you can't pronounce, or sugar, or added sugars, all of these things are hyper-processed. And uh, certainly hyper-processed oils, virtually all the oils are highly processed. Olive oil is the least but um, all of the oils have to be processed in factories. And so when you do that, you're losing vitamins, minerals, fiber, other nutrients that were in the original plant, and you're creating an extracted product that has uh, unpredictable and sometimes detrimental impact on the human body. So hyper-processed foods of all kinds, added sugars of all kinds, and then you also want to get away from animal products. And this is a big one for, mm. for a lot of us for ethical and environmental reasons, but also hugely for health reasons. So processed meats are the worst, you know, salami, bologna. and spam, you know, bologna and, and bacon and all those, those things are uh, the nitrates that are in there seem to supercharge the carcinogenic nature of them. So statistically, your risk of cancer goes up the more you eat processed meats, period. Um, and then uh, but, but also a red meat and even chicken, uh, is linked to a higher risk of heart disease, high in saturated fat. There's a lot of controversy about saturated fats and people are arguing, oh, maybe saturated fats, not so bad. Well, statistically, the more meat you eat, the more likely you are to have a heart attack. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the sober truth of it. And of course there are exceptions and there are ways to eat a certain diet that maybe may, you know, get you better outcomes than others. Certainly grass-fed, pasture-raised is going to be healthier from a purely nutritional standpoint. Uh, and from an ethical standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, it may actually be worse, we're now seeing data-wise. But, you know, frankly, it's not that much better health-wise. You're still dealing with a high amount of saturated fat, trans fats, zero fiber, and a shortage of all the phytochemicals that are associated with longevity and vibrant health, better eyesight, better cancer fighting capacities, ability to neutralize free radicals, all the stuff you want your food to do in your body. So um, I say eat less sugar, eat less processed junk, eat less animal products of all kinds, especially from factory farms. And then you open up the doors to a lot of good stuff. Now, as, as far as saturated fats concerned, there is a difference between plant-based saturated fat and animal-based saturated fat. So like coconut oil or coconut meats, or even if you ate it in its form, has it's high in saturated fat, but from what my from my understanding, it, it's treated differently in the body than animal saturated fat. Is that true? Well, there's a lot of different types of fat saturated fat. So it's not as simple as just animal oh. based and plant based. It's like there's many different different kinds of, of fats within that large meta category. Mm -hmm. And it's true, they're not all the same. And some are some are more or less impactful on the body. Um, interesting you mentioned in coconut oil. I love coconut oil culinarily speaking, yeah. uh, I would love to be able to use it a lot. It does all kinds of cool things in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, nutritionally, uh, I, I'm not impressed. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I know quite a few people who were vegan and mm -hmm. they were loading up on the coconut oil and they had high LDL cholesterol levels mm -hmm. and they gave up the coconut oil and their LDL cholesterol came right down like instantly. So you know, it's probable that that was causal. Now, people can argue about whether LDL is a good measure of arterial health, and maybe they were fine, but uh, cardiologists tend to say high LDL is bad. And some of these people were candidates for statins, but they didn't need it because they gave up coconut oil instead. So, you know, olive oil doesn't seem to have the same effect. It's kind of the opposite. Uh, you want omega-3 rich oils, uh, in particular for anti-inflammatory properties. So that's going to be like flax oil is probably the best if you can't cook with it, but you can use it like in salad dressings and things. Um, you know, controversial, but canola oil has some potential benefits from an omega-3 standpoint. Olive oil has no omega-6s or omega-3s. It's basically omega-9. So 
that's that's good. You don't want too much omega sixes. Most of us are getting way too much omega sixes. So those are high in sunflower oil, corn oil, pretty high in soy oil. You know, they're they're fairly high in canola. Most most of the oils that are used today, cottonseed oil, etc. Saturated fat wise, I would say you know using a bit of coconut oil now and then if your LDL cholesterol is fine, no problem. But if you're if you're concerned about your cholesterol levels, then then you probably want to steer clear. But if you want to eat just coconut like raw. Yeah. I mean, it's all in moderation, you know? Sure. Yeah. Statistically, most people do fine on coconut and that's different than the oil. Cause again, the oil Correct. is a refined product. Coconut right. comes with a lot of other cofactors that seem to balance it out. But if you're, if you're dealing with heart disease and you have high LDL cholesterol, I'm going to suggest you <laughs> minimize <away>. the coconut too. <laughs> Stay away from the coconut as much as yeah. you can. Yeah. Sorry to say it, but no, no, of course. Point. Absolutely. Now, can you talk about the the, the 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 major epidemic epidemic that we have in in this in, in the Western diet, which is inflammation. We most diseases are are caused by inflammation. What what foods are are hurting us? What foods can help us bring down our inflammation internally? So uh, the the number one anti-inflammatory food is is turmeric. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a superstar. So. You know, you can add turmeric powder to various foods as a, as a seasoning or condiment. Um, you'll get best absorption if you have it with some black pepper and ideally some form of fat. There are a ton of supplements on the market that, that use turmeric or curcumin, which is the primary active ingredient in turmeric. And, you know, those seem to have some benefit, but you can also just eat it, you know, regularly. And that's, that's pretty fabulous. Also omega-3 fatty acids are helpful. So ground flax seeds, ground chia seeds, adding a couple tablespoons of those, you know, meal or other foods, casseroles, um, you know, they get kind of glumpy, maybe not great in soups, but find the foods that work with them and add them even to your salads. Um, flax and chia seeds are fantastic and they're super rich in omega-3s as well as lignans and plant proteins and uh, fiber, all of which are good for you. Um, and then, um, you know, but, but omega-3s are potent anti-inflammatories. And one of the key things here is the ratio. So the average American gets about 15 parts omega-6 fatty acids to one part omega-3s. And we're best off probably more like three to one. Um, and it turns out that um, your body converts ALA omega-3s to EPA and DHA, which are critical as well. You need all three of them for brain health and for eyesight and for healthy function in your whole body. And ALA is um, the most abundant omega-3 and your body converts it to EPA and DHA most efficiently when you don't have an overabundance of omega-6s in your body. So um, that's one of the tricks. Uh, and also when you have uh, an inflammation coming down. So, um, so if you have some turmeric and aren't getting too much omega-6s, you're gonna convert omega-3s a lot more efficiently, it seems. Um, most vegans who don't eat fish are probably best off consuming an EPA and DHA supplement in their diet to make sure they're getting enough. You can get it from algae sources. Um, Cause the only source of EPA and DHA directly in the human diet when eaten as a food is fish. Um, and so people who are vegan for ethical or environmental or health reasons uh, should probably supplement with EPA and DHA to make sure they're getting enough or they should need to eat a lot of ALA and get their blood levels of EPA and DHA tested to make sure that they're converting efficiently. Now, can you discuss the importance of gut health, which is something I've recently started to study and discover how in, in, in just invaluable good gut health is that all health comes from the gut, as I forgot somebody said in ancient Greece. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, deep in your gut right now, there are trillions of biochemists that are hard at work and they're, they're, they're digesting your food and they're, they're shaping your mood and they're telling you what you do and don't want to eat. You know, genetically, you're mostly the bacteria in your gut more than you in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, and those bacteria have incredible power. Um, they produce most of the neurotransmitters that affect your mood how you feel. Interesting. You might think you decide how you feel or what happens to you decides how you feel, but actually the bacteria in your gut are shaping your mood to a tremendous extent. So the field of nutritional psychiatry 
is looking at this link and finding that there's an enormous link between diet and depression, for example, diet and anxiety, diet and mental health. And it turns out that that has a lot to do with the bacteria in the gut, the so-called microbiome and what neurotransmitters they're pr producing like serotonin and dopamine and so forth that in turn shape your, your mental state and how you feel. Um, your microbiome also digests your food and they determine, you know, essentially it, some people say you are what you eat, but it's not true. You are what you digest, you know, or you are what you don't poop. So the bacteria are the ones that are making those decisions for the most part. You can't do it on your own. Your stomach does certain things, but it really counts on the microbiome to do, it, do its job. And so having a healthy teeming, super diverse collection of bacteria in there is critical. Uh, and most of us have been essentially eviscerating our bacteria with two main things. One is antibiotics. Right. Now they can be life-saving, no question about it. There's a place for them, but we overprescribe them and we're, we're feeding three quarters of our antibiotics to livestock in factory farms. And so um, that's, that's rendering them less and less effective because we're creating antibiotic resistant bacteria, which means, means we need more of them and more different kinds in human bodies to get the same effect we used to get from just one dose. And that now means we're doing more damage to our microbiome because antibiotics wipe out life biotics, including bacteria. So then you got to rebuild. So if ever you've had antibiotics in your life, you've got to replenish from that and rebuild the good guys in there. And the number two major thing we're doing that's wiping out our microbiomes is we're not feeding them the right foods. So what the good guys need in your tummy is they need fiber, especially they need soluble and insoluble fiber, especially the soluble fiber. And that's what they eat. That's what they feast on is fiber. And so when you uh, eat animal products, which have zero fiber in them, or oils, which have zero fiber, or added sugars or white flowers, which have very, very little fiber, then you are starving the bacteria from what they need in order to thrive. And the average American gets less than, you know, less than half the fiber they should be getting, less than half, less than 5% of us get the recommended amount. And so our bacteria are paying the price in our stomachs and that's affecting our mental health, our digestion and our capacity to, to, to be well. So feeding them good bacteria with fiber is critical. Now, can you discuss the, con the, the concept of leaky gut? Cause I've heard many things happening with leaky gut and that leaky gut's responsible for so many things that go wrong in our body. Yeah. I mean, your, your gut line, actually only one cell thick. It's incredibly porous and intentionally so, but it also means that it's really easy for little holes to form essentially that things can leak through. And then, and then the, the key thing is your gut's job is to decide what should and shouldn't become you essentially. Right. And, and it's incredibly skillful at doing that. So it can assess, okay, in, out. So technically your stomach is actually the outside of your body. I know that's a crazy thought, but just because you swallow something doesn't mean it's actually in your body yet. It hasn't been accepted, you know, it's, it's, and, and then your body decides, you know, which side of the line is it on and it di digests it and breaks it down and then takes the compounds that it wants and excretes the rest through your urine and your feces. And so what happens when we have intestinal, intestinal permeability is that, um, we end up, you know, taking in some of the stuff we shouldn't be, which can often cause inflammation and can often cause an immune reaction where your body is like, oh my God, there's a foreign substance here. Sound the alarm, mount the defense. And it's like the armies are getting mobilized and the fire alarms are going off. And that's all good. If there's a bacterial infection, you want your body to get inflamed and react and deal with it. So you neutralize the bad guys, right? It's like, you're being broken into in your house in the middle of the night by robbers, you better have the alarms go off. You better be able to call 911. You better be able to take protective actions to defend yourself in your home, get the doors locked, whatever you got to do, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't want to live in that state 24 hours a day. And right. what we've got when we have intestinal permeability and chronic inflammation is it's kind of like the alarms are going off and the doors are locked and the police are coming 24 seven. And eventually like the boy who cried wolf, your system just tunes it out. You're like, ah, it's just normal. It's just noise. And so then you can't respond to a real threat when it arises because your system's already freaked out and, and, and in stressed out. And, you know, when we're in stress, we tend to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to, uh, you know, you don't save water if your house is on fire, you know, you, you, you respond. And when we're in stress and crisis mode, we tend to react rapidly, but we don't tend to 
think about the long term. So a body that's in constant fight or flight st stress reaction will not be able to prepare itself to, to cleanse, to release what it doesn't need, to store up nutrients for the future because you're in crisis mode. So a lot of us are living in crisis mode, in fear, in trigger, in reaction at a biochemical level. Of course, a lot of us are psychologically as well in the modern world. We're living in trauma response. We're living in a state of chronic fear. And so this plays out at a physical level uh, with, the, with the whole microbiome. And a lot of that is triggered by the leaky gut dynamics that I was just mentioning. So, you know, the best ways to shore up your intestinal walls and to help your your digestive tract to do its job well and to only let in the stuff that belongs is to cultivate the good bacteria. And that really comes back to fiber. Now, let me say though, that some people who haven't been eating much fiber will suddenly load up on it and they can suffer some, some uncomfortable consequences like gas, like, like even stomach pains or stomach cramps or mm -hmm. worse. And it's, it's quite common, actually, a lot of people who are not used to eating healthy foods, they try and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm farting all day. And I go back to McDonald's. <laughs> I want to go exactly, you know, because, because their body's not used to it. So the thing is to do it slowly, take one step at a time, not, don't rush in too fast. Um, that said, it's incredible how fast changes can happen. We frequently see that people within a week of changing their diet can massively end up uh, reducing their need for medications for that their cholesterol levels can plummet. Some people see their cholesterol levels drop by 30% in like a week. Seriously, you know, um, they're, they're, all the markers for diabetes can plummet. People can lose five, 10 pounds in a week when their body is ready to go and they make these changes, their body's like, oh, thank you. And everything starts to come back into balance, which, which means that if you're going to radically change your diet and go plant-based, you should absolutely do so with the care of, of a healthcare provider if you're on any medications for lifestyle illness, because you may need to change those medications. You don't want to over-medicate. You don't want to get your blood too thin, for example, if you're taking mm -hmm. blood thinners. So you've got to be tracking this because this food really can be medicine mm -hmm. and uh, in the most wonderful possible way. Unlike say statins, which can bring down your cholesterol level, but have other side effects. The only side effects of eating a healthier diet are good ones. You're also bringing down your risk of cancer. You're also bringing your risk down your risk of Alzheimer's. You're also going to feel better. You're also going to have better blood flow to your brain. You're also going to have more energy and longer life expectancy. Can you also talk about a gluten? What effect does gluten um, and wheat products and things like that have on our, our system in general? Because there's a lot of a lot of talk on both sides of that fence. Yeah, gluten's a controversial topic. So I'll, I'll wade into that a little bit with just my take on the data. So there's no one size fits all answer to any question, really. The truth is you're the only you on the planet. And so uh, just because studies show that most people most of the time benefit from one thing or another thing doesn't mean it's best for all people all the time. And gluten's a classic example because there absolutely are uh, a decent number of people who are gluten intolerant. They, or, or have celiac disease, actually about 2% of the population. So if you're in that camp, don't eat gluten, like just straight up, don't do it. You know, obviously for celiac gluten intolerance is a spectrum. You know, some people it's like, ah, I feel a little gassy when I eat gluten, or I feel a little, you know, a little off or a little stuffy, or, you know, my digestion doesn't feel great, or I feel a little headache. Well, that may be, listen to your body, see what you notice. You may do best without it. But for some people, it might also be that it's uh, the products they're having with the gluten. Maybe it was the donut and, you know, it was the added sugar, not just the wheat, right? Um, and the oil and or, the oil. Or the oil, plant. exactly. Or, or all the salt you had. So think about it in totality, you know. Um, and there are, I would say about 10% of the population seems to be gluten intolerant where we, we really do better eating little or zero gluten across the board, right? And so you might be in that group. And if you have any ongoing symptoms or, you know, digestive problems or health challenges that haven't gotten better, even as you've really cleaned up your diet, if you're eating a whole foods, plant-centered diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and uh, little to no animal products, little to no refined products, and you're still having ongoing health challenges, then definitely you may want to try giving up gluten for a few months and see if it helps. The problem is a lot of people go gluten-free and they end up eating a lot of gluten-free junk foods, you know, um, refined flours and, and get even less fiber. So it turns out that wheat, uh, wheat bran is a pretty rich source of 
fiber. It turns out to be pretty good for the good bacteria in your gut. It's one of the top sources for a lot of people. So, um, and we, pro, gluten is protein, right? And so everyone's like, oh, eat more plant protein. Well, gluten is a plant protein, but it's controversial. And so, you know, what I say is listen to your own body and see, but the studies indicate that whole, whole grain wheat products can be beneficial for most people on account of their high protein content and their high fiber content. Um, but again, that doesn't mean they're good for everybody. And for some people, they're terrible. So you gotta, you gotta listen to your own body on this one. And you talk about GMOs and how, because a lot, there's been so much talk about GMOs and it, do they really affect your body? Do they only affect your body? I'd love to hear your point of view on it. Absolutely. So first of all, what's a GMO? So people think it means God move over, but it doesn't. <laughs> it means genetically modified organism. And, you know, Monsanto, now owned by Bayer uh, and the other major biotech companies, essentially promised the world about 30 years ago that GMOs would give us more drought resistant crops, bigger yields, better nutritional value, uh, and lower pesticide consumption. Unfortunately, 30 years into the mass cultivation of these crops, the vast majority of them are yielding none of those benefits. They've led to a net increase in pesticide consumption. They've led to no improvement in flavor or nutritional value, no improvement in net yield, and no improvement in water requirements or drought tolerance. What they have brought us for the most part is crops that have one or both of two traits. Number one, they are <clears throat> pesticide producers, which is to say that they produce insecticides in every cell of the plant. And so it's true that those crops don't need to be sprayed with pesticides because they actually technically are pesticides. Bugs take a bite and their stomach splits open and they die. And the main uh, insecticide that's been cultivated to be, be produced in the cells of these plants is Bt, which is generally considered safe for humans. It's used in organic agriculture, but we're using we're consuming it in, in unprecedented quantities, and we're creating Bt resistant superbugs now. And so that threatens organic agriculture as well. And then the other major trait is herbicide tolerance. So now we can spray herbicides that kill plants on fields, and the weeds will mostly die, and the the intended plant we're trying to cultivate will not, and it makes weeding easier and weed control easier. Uh, unfortunately, it comes with a downside. We're now spraying herbicide directly on food crops in unprecedented quantities. And the main herbicide we're using in this way is glyphosate, primary active compound in Roundup. And glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. It's a probable carcinogen. And uh, it's also been patented as an antibiotic, so it can kill bacteria. And so we're spraying this on our crops. And by the way, uh, just recently, we've started spraying it on wheat and oats and certain legumes when they're not growing organically as a desiccant to dry out the crops before harvest. Ugh. And uh, so now it's become more important than ever to go organic, especially with wheat, um, but also with, uh, with oats and legumes, if you possibly can, because they may otherwise be sprayed with glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate is an environmental disaster and it's in umbilical cord blood. It's in the bodies of every human being on earth, most likely. And um, it's in our water, it's in our soil, it's in our air. And of course, most of all, it's in our food. It's being sprayed on food crops. And, um, you know, I suspect it's going to be banned at some point in the future. Um, there's, it comes with warning labels in the state of California when it's sold to the consumer. It's already starting to be banned in certain European countries. Uh, the the data is not good on this, this compound. Um, so GMOs are essentially receptacles for glyphosate and other toxic herbicides. And so those are my big problems. The, the, the notion of splicing genes from another species or a bacteria into a given plant to try to create certain effects is strikes me as concerning, perhaps even dangerous. Um, but if we can do something that does good for the world, I'm not inherently opposed. What I am concerned about is placing the power to literally create life that will reproduce in perpetuity, putting that in the hands of multinational corporations whose job it is to make money for their shareholders. And if there's a small chance of devastating risk to life on earth, but the company can make money at it, then they may just wanna do it because that's what they're in business for. Now, isn't and that it, scares me. 
isn't uh, isn't the one of the companies who owns Roundup also create GMO products? Yeah, so yeah, so Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, is the major manufacturer of Roundup, and, and they're also the major producer of Roundup resistant crops. So this is a great business model for them. You know, they're Fantastic. creating their own. They're creating their own demand, and uh, yeah, they, and they they're very intentionally so. Um, and that's that's how these these companies work. So what are the there? Because not every food is GMO. So that so are there's a handful. I think out of ten, 10 or fifteen specific crops that are GMO, and they're trying others. But for right now, there's only a handful. Can you list those off? Yeah, the big ones right now are going to be corn. Is corn and soy are the big two, um, and uh, they're mainly used for livestock feed and ethanol for cars. In the case of corn. Um, we do eat some, but, but, you know, most of that soy is not going to tofu. It's, it's going to livestock feed and also soybean oil, uh, as well. So they make soy oil and they make soy meal and the meal part is fed to livestock and the oil part is used in all kinds of processed foods. Um, and then, um, and then we've got, uh, sugar beets, which are primarily genetically engineered. So half of our sugar supply, what you call table sugar in the U S is made from cane sugar. And the other half is made from genetically engineered sugar beets. And then we've got cotton, which is used, of course, in clothing, but also in uh, cottonseed oil in the, in the food industry. And then we've got alfalfa, which is used, again, for livestock. So the GMO industry is mainly being used for hyper-processed foods and livestock feed, you know, as opposed to food for humans. However, these hyper-processed foods, are, are the ingredients from these GMOs are in all kinds of hyper-processed foods. So you got to look at labels, but you will find GMOs in all kinds of things if you're looking, whether it's, you know, high fructose corn syrup or cornstarch or soy oil or various derivatives from them. Um, and then, um, so yeah, about 75% of the foods on supermarket shelves contain GMOs at this point. And, um, but, but the big ones are just those, th those things. So it's corn and soy and, oh, and canola, I should mention as well, which is used in canola oil and but sugar have, beets. But they don't have potatoes yet or... So there are there are a few GMOs that are starting to come on the market. Uh, certain apples, um, oh, God. certain yes, there is a there is a GMO potato that's starting to come into the mix now, um, and um, so it's starting. It's not the the dominant strains yet, but these are these are emerging, um, uh, and uh, and there will be more in the future. There's also GMO salmon. So some of our some of our uh, farmed salmon, including salmon you see on restaurant menus, is from genetically engineered salmon now, and, and there's no labeling and no controls around that, unfortunately. Um, really? So unless it's wild, but if it's farmed, which most of it is, then it, it could be genetically engineered. And this company, Aqua Bounty, came up with a type of salmon that that doesn't um, that grows much faster than regular salmon, so it can it can get to market weight, you know, in a third the time because it doesn't have the gene in it that would cause it to stop, stop growing in the winter. So it just keeps going, going, going nonstop. And, um, you know, the danger is if these get out in the wild, they will probably outcompete wild salmon and sure. could literally eliminate wild salmon, like take over, you know, within a pretty short period of time. So hopefully that will not happen, but if it does, then, then salmon will never be the same. Let me ask you a, a cooking question now. So we always like to add flavor to our, our foods. Uh, what is a healthy way to add that flavor? Because, you know, it's normally stuff that's not good for you. You know, broccoli with cheese on it is delicious, uh, but not really that healthy. So there's what, what are some healthy ways to add flavor? Well, there's so many good ways to add flavor. You know, um, the biggest one is spices. I mean, uh, spices are really, really good for you. Like seriously, cayenne pepper, black pepper, garlic, onions, cinnamon, turmeric. I already mentioned earlier, um, cilantro for those who like it. Um, not everyone does. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, there there are uh, so many wonderful spices out there. Saffron uh, is turns out to be linked to helping fight depression. Uh, a lot of these spices are anti-inflammatory, remarkably enough. So cayenne pepper and all of the spicy peppers turn out to have powerful anti-inflammatory compounds in them that help help your body. It's, it's fascinating because they're spicy. So you think they're, right. they're like, ah, Inflamed. that actually they're, they're, what they're doing on the inside is helping your body cool down and calm down. Really interesting how that works. Um, yeah, garlic is linked to cancer prevention. 
Um, so, so all of these things are amazing for pr promoting health and bringing down inflammation in the body and they add flavor. And the other good news is when people use more spices in their cooking, they use less sugar and less salt for flavor um, because the food has more of its own taste, right? So making friends with your spice cabinet is one of the top tips for healthy eating and healthy lifestyle. So get to know what's in there, clear out the stuff that's been sitting there collecting cobwebs for 17 years or that you inherited from your great grandmother and mm -hmm. make, make your spice cabinet a real active, alive part of your life and make different mixes or get different mixes, uh, enhance your culinary experience. The, the fastest way to radically change it, to enhance your culinary life with minimal effort is just changing what spices you use and adding more of them and more different kinds and getting to know it works. You can also, by the way, mix sweet and savory, you know, like allspice or cinnamon can be really good on some savory dishes. It's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, they just add a really interesting richness to them. Uh, and similarly, people are putting chili and, and cayenne in chocolates, for example, now yes. and finding that they're amazing. So, you know, mix it up a little bit and see what you learn, but, you know, spices are your friend. I've, I've read that cinnamon is one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet it's just you can't eat a lot of it at one time but well that's true with all the spices uh yeah but you don't need a lot that right. that 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 flavor oh, turns so out to be nutrition uh at, at a very intense level yeah it's pretty amazing yeah. it's pretty amazing now another issue that we have as as just normal people living our lives is every time we sometimes we go out to eat and restaurants generally don't care about health. They care about things tasting good. So you can come back to it. And that goes from fine dining all the way to, you know, fast food. How can you eat? Uh, what advice do you have for people who are eating out to try to eat healthy? So first of all, I'll say that to the extent that you can plan ahead and make your own food, you will save money. You'll eat better. You'll become the master of your own destiny. You'll feel more empowered. Um, restaurants in general, have a bit of a disincentive economically to provide healthy food. They don't have to disclose ingredients for the most part. And they therefore, if they can use cheaper ingredients and enhance pump up flavor that gets the customer to come back, that's to their benefit. And so a lot of them are using ingredients you'd never actually want to use in your kitchen. That's just the fact of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that said, of course, there are restaurateurs who are thoughtful and caring sure. and creative and love feeding their customers and whose bottom line isn't just the almighty dollar, it's serving good food, you know, um, and that's what they're in business for. And so finding those is wonderful and supporting them is wonderful. And who doesn't like to try something new that somebody else did all the work and you just get to walk in and enjoy it, right? They spent years honing their craft and finessing this particular recipe and now you just get to go partake right that's kind of fun and they do all the dishes too so there's a lot to like about restaurants but they do cost money they tend to drag down our nutritional status and uh it, it's surprising how much time and energy it can take to earn the money to pay for the restaurant meal plus the time it takes to drive there and drive home etc so a lot of times you can actually save time as well as money by eating in so to speak um if you are eating out um, you know, look for restaurants, obviously, that serve some organic foods and that, that offer some plant-based options. If they specialize in that, all the better. But even like at a steakhouse, you may be able to get, you know, a salad and a potato and some steamed veggies, uh, you know, and, you know, get your own, get, get creative with sauces, you know, mm. ask if they can make a little curry for you or, you know, uh, worst case, I've, I've been known to you know, order at some restaurants. I just asked for a baked potato and some, some, some uh, grilled veggies. And then I'll put, and I'll get some black pepper and some salt and some olive oil on there, you know, and it's, it's not a feast, but if you're, if you're struggling and it's literally all you got and you don't want to compromise on your principles, those are options. Or for breakfast, a lot of times you can get oatmeal and you can get it without sugar and butter if you want and cream, if you want to do that and add other things, add in cinnamon and raisins and fruit to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are options that you can, you can get creative with. You can order what's called off the menu where you ask them to mix up different ingredients they've got in creative ways. And most restaurants are happy to do that. Um, but ideally you're going to a restaurant that's honed their craft and loves serving healthy food that's, that's plant-based and that you can really enjoy. Obviously that's the best. And you can look up menus online before you go. So you can, and you can, if you're going out with a friend, you know, you can plan ahead and make sure it's a restaurant that works for you. 
you don't have to be, make a big fuss about it. If you're afraid of appearing fussy, don't say like, okay, I've analyzed 17 restaurants and here's my spreadsheet. And these are the four in <laughs> ranking order that I'm uh, that are acceptable to me. You can just make a suggestion. Hey, want to go to this place? You know, <laughs> and they don't have to know that you did some research in advance. And all you have to do is find one thing that works for you and that works, right? You don't have to be able to eat the whole menu. So, you know, I think you can get creative and, and find options. Um, and uh, ultimately it can actually be fun. And Google, you know, in your city or town or community, healthy restaurants and see what you find. And you may find some new place you didn't even know existed that offers some cool stuff and that, that chose in their own search ranking efforts to put the word healthy feature, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they're healthy, but it means that they want to be seen that way, which could be a good sign. Now, what are some great snacks that we could have? Because I know snacking is a big issue for me. So uh, I just love, is there any good advice on snacking? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, some of the healthiest snacks are going to be uh, nuts and seeds uh, with maybe with some dried fruit in there, little raisins like trail mix is really, really good. It's nutrient dense and also calorie dense. You don't want to overwhelm with that, but that can be good. I personally love veggies with hummus or other sauces or dips, but hummus is super healthy. So dipping the carrots or, you know, celery in hummus is lovely, super good for you. Uh, berries are wonderful, including frozen. If you, you know, don't have fresh and you can also do frozen fruit. You know, you can get frozen peach slices or apple slices or whatever and snack away on that if you want to. Um, and, uh, you know, kale chips, if you want to get more industrious or make your own with a dehydrator can be wonderful. Uh, great snack, give you that crunchy flavor rich thing, but also give you lots of amazing nutrients. Um, th those are some of my uh, favorite snacking options, along with fruit. I mean, just straight up fruit or fruit with peanut butter, you know, apple slices with some peanut butter can be wonderful. Um, and, um, yeah, those are some of my favorites. Now, um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions that I ask all of my guests. What is your mission in this life? <laughs> well, first I'll say the mission of food revolution network is healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all. And that really captures a lot of what I'm up to in the world right now. Um, healthy because I want people to be healthy. I want people to not need to die of heart disease and cancer. I want people to have the vitality that they need to do what they were born to do, to give their gifts, to live in a big way, to love in a big way, to play with their kids and grandkids and great grandkids, to, to, to make their mark in a good way on this planet, right? And I want them to have the nutrients they need to do that. Ethical because uh, our food system is uh, murdering and torturing animals in factory farms because it's treating the workers horrendously. The life expectancy for farm workers in the state of California is 49 years. Um, people are being contaminated with massive amounts of pesticides in the fields. So when you go organic, you aren't just impacting you, you're also impacting them. You're impacting the people who are out there growing your food so they don't have to be poisoned in the fields and die of cancer in their 40s. Um, and so I want an ethical system where the people who grow our food are treated respectfully and are paid enough to feed their own families. And then uh, sustainable because, uh, you know, I want us to have a livable world for future generations. I'm terrified by climate change. I'm terrified by deforestation, topsoil erosion, aquifer depletion, the, the, the preponderance of droughts and floods and the likelihood that billions of people are going to be starving in the next generation because they won't have the conditions to grow enough food on this planet for those people. And we're going to have billions of environmental refugees as coastal lands are flooded and ecosystems are devastated by droughts and so forth. So from my perspective, if we can do something to turn that around, we can make a huge impact for the future of life on earth. And food turns out to be at the absolute epicenter of that. So sustainable is big to me. And it's not just preserve the status quo. It's actually regenerative. I actually want to heal and build a world that's better. I want to leave a world that's brighter and healthier for future generations. I want humans to be able to identify not as a cancer on the earth, but as living participants of life, helping to heal itself and restore itself. So really that, that's Food Revolution Network's mission. And then it's for all because I want healthy, ethical, sustainable food for everybody, not just the elite few, not just those of us who can afford to shop at Whole Foods with our whole paychecks. I want healthy food for everybody who eats and who everybody who wants to eat so that it's not an elitist luxury. And part of how we do that is by eating lower on the food chain. We can, you know, we can save huge amounts of grain and topsoil and water and land and ecosystems 
by eating lower on the food chain, it takes 12 pounds of grain or soy to make one pound of feedlot beef. The other 11 are being essentially wasted. We've got a protein factory in reverse with the industrialized food system. And with pasture-raised and grass-fed meat, it takes so much land that it's an environmental disaster. I mean, rainforest beef is technically pasture raised, but it's coming at enormous cost for future generations. So we've got to lower on the food chain if we want to be true to what Gandhi said, which is, you know, refuse to have what the masses cannot. Make yourself rich by making your wants few. We have to eat lighter, walk lighter on the earth. And food is the number one way we can do that. So all of those things are very deep in my heart. And ultimately at the end of the day, for me, food is a means to a greater end. I wanna help us to weave ourselves back into the web of life. I want us to do what we were born to do. I want us to live with meaning and purpose and conviction and love and joy and integrity. And I think that when we bring our food choices into alignment with our values, we can do all that. And what is the ultimate purpose of life? Well, in my experience, life is constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. And so its purpose ultimately is to, to evolve, to learn, to discover, to grow, to create, to innovate, to experiment, uh, to see what works and what doesn't, and to keep learning. So, you know, I think that that's, that's the critical question for us as humans, will, be, will we be, because we're seeing some things right now in, in our behaviors as a species that don't work. Mm. you know, that are not sustainable. Will right. we learn from that? Will we evolve fast enough to realize, oh my gosh, if you cut down all the forests, <laughs> you can't live on this planet. If you, if you torture animals in factory farms and make that how you grow your food and, and, and exploit massive amounts of resources to feed that livestock, and then you give yourself heart disease and cancer, it doesn't work. There's cost to this system and we can do better, you know? And there's so many ways that I think humans can evolve. And so the question is, will we learn? Will we get the feedback? Will we get the data? Will we learn from it? Will we allow it to inform ourselves so that our past doesn't have to equal our future? Because in some ways, our current course is a one-way road to oblivion. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I believe we can turn course. We can shift direction. And what we need is the information to be a part of feedback loops that flow through our bodies and our choices. So to me, the purpose of life is evolution. And humans have to decide whether we're going to be part of that or not. And where can people find out more about you, uh, where to buy the books and, and, and find out the work that you're doing? Well, 31 Day Food Revolution is the book that I wrote, and it's designed to help you implement all that we're talking about today. At the end of the day, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, they don't care too much how many books you read or podcasts <laughs> you listen to. They care what you eat and how you live. So right. It's not what you know, it's what you do that matters most. And so I wrote 31 Day Food Revolution to help you, yes, understand the data and learn from it, but also implement all that we're talking about. So 31 chapters, like 31 flavors of ice cream, but at the end of the day, these 31 steps will help you have more pleasure and more joy even than ice cream would. And they will also, every chapter ends with action steps you can take to implement all that you're learning. So that's number one. Number two, go to foodrevolutionsummit.org to register for our free Food Revolution Summit and learn from the top food experts on the planet or go to foodrevolution.org to check out hundreds and hundreds of articles on our website about pretty much every food and health topic imaginable so you can learn the latest insights and how you can apply it in your life. Ocean, it has been a pleasure talking to you. You are so passionate about what you do. It's always wonderful to talk to passionate people. And I hope that this conversation opens the eyes for some people and uh, helps, helps you with your food revolution and helps the planet and helps us all get a little bit healthier. So I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Appreciate you too, Alex. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey. And don't forget to subscribe.